Good afternoon, everyone. Or oh, actually, in fact, good morning or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Uh, thank you for taking your time out of your day to join us for this Adam Matthew webinar, uh, Culture, Society and Politics in 1990s Britain, Studying the Decade Using Mass Observation Project. My name is Holly Francis. I'm part of the marketing team at Adam Matthew, and I'll be acting as your moderator for today's session. Before we begin, there's just a couple of um, things I wanted to run over, some housekeeping points, and also just to give people a couple more minutes to join. Um, today's webinar is being recorded, so this recording will be shared with you in the coming days via email, and it will also be, attend uh, also be sent to those that can attend today live. Um, all attendees are muted. This is just to ensure that we get a really good recording for people who couldn't attend, and also uh, a really good piece of shareable content if you wanted to send it to your colleagues. If at any point during today's webinar, you find yourself experiencing any kind of audio issues, uh, we found that the best thing to do is to try leaving the meeting and then returning, making sure you've selected that computer audio option that's highlighted on the screen. Um, I mean, it's unlikely to happen. And as I mentioned, the recording of the session is being recorded. So don't worry if you miss anything. We'll make sure you get that recording afterwards. I appreciate that anyone that's experiencing audio issues now is not going to be able to hear any of this. But hopefully having that on the screen will, will help anyone that's having that initial issue. For anyone who's unfamiliar with using GoToWebinar, your control panel should look something like this image here on the left with your audio option and your question, question section. If you find yourself experiencing any kind of technical issues during today's webinar, please do just pop it into the question sections there um, and I'll do my best to pick that up and help you as we're going through today. We do have time for questions at the end of today's session. So please do use this section to submit them for our speakers as we go. Don't feel the need to, to hold them to the end. You can submit them as well as we're speaking. Um, we'll do our best obviously to get to as many of those as possible in the time allotted um, and then hopefully we'll be able to follow up with any that we don't get to. I think that's, I think we've got a Miss people join now and I think that's all of my housekeeping. So with that, I'm going to move on and introduce you to today's fantastic panel of speakers. So first of all, my colleague, Rosie Perry, who has been instrumental in leading the production of this mass observation project module two, which faces on the 1990s. And it's obviously the topic of today's webinar. Um, Rosie's going to be providing a little bit of insight into the project and the material. We're also joined today by Jessica Scantlebury and Kirsty Patrick from the University of Sussex. They're going to be sharing a bit of the background to the Mass Observation Archive, as well as some of the work recently undertaken, um, particularly with regards to the COVID-19 pandemic. We're also joined by Florence Sutcliffe Braithwaite of University College London to talk, to talk about the material in Mass Observation Project and what it can reveal about social divisions, class and race. I'm also joined by Glenn O'Hara of Oxford Brookes University, who's going to be taking a closer look at one of the 1997 directives around that year's general election. So that's a quick rundown of today's speakers and our session outline. At this point, I'm going to pass you over to Rosie to begin today's session, and I will meet you all at the end for the Q&A. So please rem remember to submit those questions as we're going. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Rosie. Thanks, Holly. Hi everyone, uh, it's great to be here with you today to, um, and with this wonderful panel of speakers as well to shine a spotlight on the second module of our Mass Observation Project 1981 to 2009 resource. Um, it's been a real pleasure to work with this material and with everybody speaking today, so it's um, yeah a joy to be here. I'll briefly say for those of you who may be less familiar that the Mass Observation Project was launched by David Pocock and Dorothy Sheridan at the University of Sussex in 1981 as a rebirth of the wartime mass observation and is one of the most important sources of qualitative social data in the UK. The structure of this resource and of the Mass Observation Project is quite simple. Themed directives, which are kind of like questionnaires, were sent out to willing observers who then responded anonymously with their thoughts and opinions. After the successful publication of the 1980s material in summer 2020, we're so pleased to now make available the directives and the responses issued and gathered by the project during the 1990s. The directives during this period were varied, ranging from the political, the historical and the personal. Amongst other topics, observers were asked to record diaries on their thoughts on the unfolding Gulf War conflict, questions about the towns and villages where they lived, about the royal family and about the upcoming millennium. 
it's so interesting to experience the highs and the lows, the political landslides, the royal tragedies, and even the fascinating mundane aspects of everyday life in Britain through those who were living it as they were living it. So I've included a screenshot here of the homepage of the Mass Observation Project. And if I go through to the next slide, what you'll see is a snippet of our Browse by Directives page. So these directives can all be explored using this Browse by Directives page in the resource. This is a directory of all the directives issued in the 1990s, along with the themes that they cover. I've only managed to include a small snippet here because it's quite a long list. Clicking on one of these will take you to a document list page, like the one that you can see on the right. Um, which always displays the directive itself first as the top entry and then all of the individually catalogued responses to that directive below. As well as digitizing this material, the core job of my editorial colleagues during the production process was to individually index each and every response delivered by an observer during the 1990s. As with the first module, this means that not only can the responses be filtered by the directive they are responding to, but by the biographical data that Mass Observation Project records about its participants too, such as date of birth, region, sex. As well as providing important context about who the views you're reading belong to, it vastly increases browsability. For example, it allows you to um, discover responses by women in their 30s in London or by divorced men um, over 70 in the northwest of England. Once a user has found a response that they're interested in through searching or browsing, they have the additional option to search within an individual response. And thanks to handwritten text recognition, this is available for both printed and manuscript material. The metadata summary here on the right shows um, important information such as the title, sex, year of birth, and full metadata will be available below this document as well, which doesn't fit on this screenshot. So alongside the responses and their metadata, um, the resource also hosts research tools such as essays, video interviews and exhibitions, which provide important context to the material and the project and offer users ways into the material through links. We've been able to include some fantastic additions for module two, including essays that we'll hear about shortly from Glenn and from Florence and exhibitions based around insights into the mass observation project in the 1990s that Jessica and Kirsty are going to share with us now. Thank you very much. Oh, it's so wonderful to see it all, all going live. So um, yeah, thank you for having us today. So Mass Observation is a national archive that's been collecting narrative material on everyday life in Britain since 1937. We're going to introduce you to the work of Mass Observation in the 1990s. But also we wanted to take this opportunity today to introduce you to our most contemporary work, capturing people's everyday lived experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, mass observation um, in the 1990s was based within the walls of the University of Sussex Library and formed part of its special collections. Professor Dorothy Sheridan, pictured here on the right, led the project through this decade. Dorothy had worked with Tom Harrison, who's pictured up at the top there on the left. He was one of Mass Observation's founders and came to Sussex with the archive in the late 1970s. Dorothy catalogued the majority of material collected by Mass Observation during the Second World War and therefore had a long-standing relationship with its work. She worked with Professor David Pocock, an anthropologist at Sussex, to launch the Mass Observation project in 1981 and they worked together until his retirement in the early 1990s. One of the first directives that developed under Dorothy's leadership was on close relationships. And this showed a change of approach to the questions with a greater emphasis on life story narrative. Correspondents were encouraged to respond to topics which might be described as both personal and public. And you can see here a selection of directive themes covered in the 90s. These encouraged people to share their thoughts and experiences on personal, social and political events. They were encouraged to be reflective, to look back across their life course, and to do this in relation to their family, friends, and acquaintances. So rather than trying to recruit writers through direct methods, the writing panel has always been self-selecting, and the focus of the project is on voluntary self-motivated participation. In the first years of operation, the mass observation team tried to spread the word 
in numerous national and local newspapers to recruit writers to the newly launched project. During the 90s, applications came from people who found out about the project during attention in the press, radio and from book publications using um, material from mass observations activities during the Second World War. Two um, diaries which are often cited as inspiration for inquiring about joining the project are Now Last War and Dorothy Sheridan's edited wartime diary of Naomi Mitchardson among you taking notes. In this slide, you can see a letter from a 21 year old who has heard about mass observation while studying A-level sociology at school and is subsequently reminded about the project whilst following a feature on the TV. Correspondents have cited various reasons for participating in the project. Many see the project as a chance to record their personal history and observations for posterity, but also to participate in active current research. For some, writing for MO feels like a worthwhile form of social research compared to other responses. This is because it's relatively unrestricted and closer to a, um, a form of stream of consciousness rather than market research. Here, writer F1373 explains that, when I die, I want to leave things. I don't want to just pop my clogs and they'll say, well, there she goes, cheerio, goodbye. I want them to say, well, she wrote a book. She did writing for mass observation. She knitted me a lovely bedspread, things like that, you know. I won't be able to leave any cooking behind, will I? But you know, I like to think there's gonna be a lot of me left, really. And H2359 says, for me, there is something about important about being one in a thousand plus contributors who are writing regularly and responding to the same topic all over the country. It feels like a mass movement. So looking at its research value, during the 1990s, directive responses were used for research, teaching and community engagement. Open days at the archive attracted interest in members of the local community, as well as students and academics. They were keen to view the material and hear about the collections. As interest grew, study days were designed with a programme of talks and discussions to enable more in-depth engagement with selected material from across the archives. These eventually became accredited evening courses, supporting the university's lifelong learning provision. Mass observation material became integral to many undergraduate and postgraduate courses across disciplines during this decade, and the collaborative work between Dorothy and academic colleagues provided rich learning experiences using this unique collection. So coming on to today, mass observation remained active beyond the 1990s, and today you'll find us at the Keep pictured here, which is a purpose-built state-of-the-art archive research centre in Falmer, just opposite the University of Sussex campus. And here we provide access to the archive for research, learning and teaching alongside our partners from East Sussex and Brighton and Hove. And the Keep is also the place where we mail out the directives to our current panel of writers. That is, of course, until the pandemic hit and we all had to leave the building. So when COVID emerged and the country went into lockdown, and just before, as Kirsty said, we left our offices, we sent out some correspondence to our observers requesting that they do documented their experiences as the events unfolded. We were, we were particularly worried that we might not be able to communicate with them during this time. We didn't know how it was going to go. So we wanted them to keep mindful to send things into mass observation. But our first letter to them included questions like, have you or others that you know been affected by the virus? virus have you been ill have you been doing anything to protect yourself or others from the virus have you self-isolated have you changed your behaviors and what do you think about the uk government's response to the pandemic we also asked them to um, submit diaries and many of them did and some of them are still recording the pandemic now and they're still arriving with us um, we also had an influx of new writers wanting to join the project and we received over 500 applications to join. And during the time, our active panel, those who were responding to directives, increased from 400 to 700 writers. Um, during the pandemic, as it turned out, we didn't have problems communicating with our observers. We could continually, regularly send out directives to them 
and we sent out directives in the spring, summer and autumn. And these asked varied questions about the pandemic experience. There were questions about routine, time, hygiene, well-being and also recycling. But we've also issued a directive recently um, in spring 2021 on the vaccine programme and how people see this is going. So we've been overwhelmed by the interest and have generated a substantial collection of narrative material, which will be of interest to researchers across the disciplines, both now and in many years to come. The format includes in-depth diaries written continuously and also one-off single day diaries, which were sent to us in response to our annual 12th of May diary initiative. Also the responses to the four directives and also um, other collections donated by organisations documenting COVID, so organisations such as the E3A. Researchers have the opportunity to explore the material thematically or longitudinally. You can follow a particular writer across the pandemic or even further back if they've been long term writers. So it would be possible to view the writing of someone who responded in the 1990s to alongside their COVID response right now. And here are two extracts. In response to the spring directive, M5645 writes, I feel like I've lost my brain again. I wanted to cry after I finished work. There's so much. And meanwhile, people are stressing about their library card pin numbers. Of course they are. I was furious with Kay last night because of how he put the duvet on the bed. It doesn't matter, but your brain seems to latch onto something. Can you get mad about that? Because what else can you do? And here we have an extract from a 13 year old who submitted their day diary for the 12th of May project. The mood here is great. Even though everyone is gloomy and bored, people have been great at cheering each other up. I'm currently working on a video of my friends and I look a bit stupid, which should make people laugh when it's finished. Every Thursday at eight o'clock, everyone goes onto the street and claps for the NHS, National Health Service. It's awesome hearing all the claps from nearly everyone in the neighborhood. It's also a good chance to say hi to neighbours from two metres away. People have also been putting drawings of rainbows in their windows to support the NHS nurses and doctors. It's cool how everyone in the country feels so united. Now this slide is intended to highlight the spread of submissions we received to the archive and this is related specifically to our 12th of May day diary call. So in 2020 we saw over 5,000 people submitting these types of diaries from across the UK and Ireland and this was phenomenal because usually our annual response is in the hundreds. Um, we even received diaries from Europe, America and Australia and as a result we ended up recruiting a short-term cataloguing post to support with the processing of these and making them available. The 12th of May is of course next week so we would be thrilled if you could take part this year and there'll be further information on this on our website. So just before we come to an end we wanted to mention the opportunities for uh, collaborating with us and generating a directive relating to your research. Um, the majority of the directives are the result of non-commercial paid commissions in collaboration with academic researchers across the disciplines. There's usually a fee which usually forms part of a funding application and we've supported projects of varying sizes from postdoc research to larger ESRC grants. On our website you can see um, a list of all the previous directives and also some information about working with us. But here on this slide there is um, uh, a word cloud of some of the themes that we have issued in, in recent years. Um, the narrative responses that come in in response to a directive questionnaire are available in our reading rooms at the Keep and where possible we can make electronic responses available to the commissioning researcher. Again, this data can be used alongside the 90s material published today by Adam Matthews Digital. And we also um, have an online database which researchers can use to find out more about the biographical metadata of our writers and the responses to the current directives. And this uh, database can be navigated to from our main web page, which we've listed here on this slide. But if you have any questions about mass observation or the mass observation project, or we'll just want to get in touch with us generally, our contact details are here. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Kirsty. I think now we're passing over to Florence. Thanks very much. 
So I'm going to talk about um, one particular um, directive that was sent out in 1990 um, and the responses to which are, are held in this collection. And what I want to do is kind of um, introduce the, the directive itself um, and talk a little bit about the kind of really rich array of possibilities that I think it offers to historians um, and in particular some of the ways in which that um, having this material available online enables us to do things that were not possible or not particularly easy when you're actually going to the archive in the keep but which suddenly kind of opened up as new possibilities um, now that the material is accessible in this online format. And many of the things um, that I'm going to say I think relate very directly, very transferable to work that one might do with other um, directives in the collection. So the directive that I'm going to talk about um, and that I've written a kind of short blog uh, about for the online collection is the directive that was sent out on the topic of social divisions in 1990. So the first thing um, that I always do when I'm approaching any um, mass observation directive is of course to read the directive itself and I also think it's really interesting and productive to place each directive or attempt to kind of place each directive um, in the context of other directives that have been sent out on similar sorts of topics um, in the um, in earlier uh, mass observation years. So when looking at this directive on social divisions in 1990 there are two really obvious uh, sort of earlier divisions that um, touched on very similar kinds of topics. So in particular, those directives were a 1939 directive that was issued on the topic of class um, and which asked the observers to probe what it called the nexus of social attitudes and behaviour which make up the class complex. This was actually a very lengthy directive um, and it was divided into two because there were so many questions in it. And then in 1948, after the war, uh, mass observation turned again to this issue of class, which was, as you can see, really quite central to much of the, the kind of thinking of MO um, in its first incarnation. And this time, um, observers were asked uh, a shorter series of questions. Um, so they were asked whether they saw themselves as belonging to a class, which class and why, and then they were asked to list occupations that they would see as belonging to the working classes and the middle classes. So the 1990 Directive on Social Divisions is interestingly somewhat similar to these earlier directives. So for example, there was also a request that um, observers place certain occupations in a list according to which they saw as having a higher kind of class or status. Uh, but it was also different to those earlier directives focusing solely on class in that the Directive on Social Divisions, as you can sort of imagine from the, the title that they've given it, Social Divisions, attempted to kind of think much more expansively. So it posed questions not just about class, but also about race, gender, religion, and culture. So you can see some of these questions um, on this slide. You can see the questions about, um, in particular, class. They're asking what it meant to be working class and middle class. And they're also asking specifically about snobbishness. They're asking people to list these occupations, teacher, lawyer, journalist, pop star, TV, news presenter, minister of religion and accountant in order. And they were also asking uh, specific questions about race, for example, whether observers had regular dealings with people of a different race from your own. They also asked some questions that kind of cut across. So, for example, this question about whether observers felt they belonged to a minority in British society. And they finished with a set of questions um, that focused on issues around equal opportunity, uh, liberalism or a kind of plural society, um, the British nation and national identity, and the question of 
demands for rights. And we can see, I think, in these questions, uh, the way in which mass observation was very clearly shaped by the context of spring 1990, when this directive was being sent out. So the Conservatives um, under Margaret Thatcher had been in power at this point for over a decade, uh, although Thatcher would, of course, um, be unseated as Prime Minister by members of her own party by the end of the year. And Thatcher had very much promised to kind of expand freedom and opportunity. But by the end of the 80s, of course, many on the left had, were suggesting that she had, in fact, done exactly the opposite um, with high unemployment, um, disorders in inner city areas like famously Brixton in, in 1981, uh, and hostility towards the women's liberation movement and black and anti-racist activism. 1990 had also seen um, the kind of culmination of the Rushdie affair, which also kind of propelled issues of race and national identity and culture to the kind of center of public debate. And that I think also kind of underlay some of the specific questions that the directive was asking. So reading the directive itself, I think can actually be incredibly important, um, not only because it of course is vital to understand the questions that the observers were responding to in order to, to kind of really understand their answers, but also I think because it tells us a lot about the, the sort of topics that mass observation itself was interested in at the particular moment in time. So I thought I would show you just a couple of really interesting passages. Um, this first one about class, and then I'll show you one about race as well, uh, from responses that were given by mass observers to this directive. And I think these give you a sense of just how kind of rich this material is and um, how much we can get out of it. So this first response um, is a, a female respond, um, responder um, who was living in Wales uh, at the time of, the of writing this um, and who uh, had been born in 1931. And it's interesting that we've already heard sociology and the significance of kind of sociology and, and the teaching of sociology in, in schools and um, here at, at a uh, higher education um, institute, a teacher training college in particular, um, in this session, because I think this is something that actually comes up in quite a lot of the, these responses relating to class in 1990, which I, I think is really interesting in and of itself. It's, I think, a sign of how significant a reach sociology kind of gained into the population in the post-war period through being taught in schools and in further and higher education. And this observer drew on her studies in sociology when thinking about the issue of class and thinking about sociological classifications and market research classifications. So that's that kind of A, B, C1, C2, D, E classification that you still is still in use today. And the interesting thing about this response is that the, this um, mass observer is clearly very aware of and um, able to use those classifications, but also um, coming back to the question of snobbishment demonstrates this sort of skepticism or hostility towards that way of kind of classifying people. So I think we can learn a lot from reading passages like this in the mass observer's responses. Um, we can learn a lot about not only the sort of cultural repertoires that they were able to draw on in thinking about a topic like class, but also their emotional reaction to thinking about a subject like class. The second um, little extract that I've um, put up on the next slide for you to take a look at is um, a male responder uh, who was a little bit older than that earlier. Um, Mass observer, he was born in 1925. And in this passage, he's talking about um, the issues of race that the directive had asked respondents to respond to. And strikingly, and uh, we find a similar thing with many of the other respondents, he mentioned the issue of Islam in his response. And here he gives a, a, a sort of um, his own take on the recent history of Britain. Uh, so his take is that, in fact, there's been um, 
he says, a frightening display of hatred from this group. And I think we can probably assume that the Rushdie affair had influenced his thinking here, or this is one of the things that he was thinking about when he wrote this. Uh, so this is an example of a way in which I think we can try to use the observer's responses in order to kind of try and understand how mass observers in the past constructed their own recent history, what their ideas were about how Britain had changed over time and why. And that's another thing that I think that this, this collection is incredibly useful for. Anyway, I could show you loads more fascinating extracts um, from the observer's um, thoughts, but I've just put up two because I didn't want to take up too much time, but I hope that's given you a, a flavour of the real richness and depth of this material. And the, the particular thing that this material allows you to do, I think, um, really effectively is to kind of uh, link up uh, different particular observers um, and find out more about them over time. So it makes it incredibly easy to look up this, this chap, S2463, find other responses that he's given over time and, and try and understand kind of how individual observers um, thinking on a particular topic has changed over time, which is really, really exciting. So I hope that's given you a few ideas about um, the kinds of questions we can ask, and the kind of kinds of things that we can do with, with this directive um, and indeed with, with all the other directives, because this is just such a, a huge and brilliant resource. So thank you. Thank you, Florence. That was a really interesting look at some of the, the content we have in the resource there. Um, at this point, we're just going to hand over to you, Glenn. Oh, I'm, I'm now unmuted. Many thanks and uh, many thanks for inviting me to speak and thank you all for coming today to hear us talk about the mass observation papers and the 1990s. It makes me feel extremely old to remember all of this, but uh, some of you will remember some of it along with me. And I'm just going to scoot through, I think, some of the themes of the 1997 election, which we can address through the mass observation papers online, which I hope will be interesting for you because we remember the general election of 1997, of course, as a particularly unitary moment, which is interesting, a moment when our electoral geography is extremely fractured, when you have challenge of Scottish and Welsh nationalists, you have conservative Liberal Democrat fights in the southwest of England, you have Labour successful in big cities and the Conservatives more and more successful in towns. Well, this was a period when certainly the managing or overriding discourse was of a singular triumph where Labour really pushed all before it, carried all before it under the youthful and modernising leadership of Tony Blair, of course, Labour's first election victor since Harold Wilson back in the 1960s and 70s, who evoked a similar allure of futurism, modernity and youth. And this was Labour's greatest ever victory and certainly its greatest ever peacetime triumph at which it gained a huge majority over 170 seat majority something which today seems almost beyond it and almost fantastical almost out of the pages of science fiction given that the Labour Party today in Parliament is reduced after suspensions and after the speaker to under 200 seats well in 1997 Labour had more than 400 seats it had more than double the seats it has now and it won in places that today are far beyond it, which have seats which have, of course, conservative majorities measured not in the thousands, but in the tens of thousands. Seats like Crosby, which I picked out there in suburban Merseyside, because it was the seat of the triumph of Shelley Williams and the Social Democrats in the 1980s in a famous early 1980s by-election after the Social Democrats had broken away from Labour and formed their own more centrist SDP. Well, here, in the land of the discourse then, Mondeo man, perhaps what we call centrist dad today, Labour won on this vast swing of 18%, far bigger swing uh, even than the recent triumph of the Conservative Party in December 2019. A suburban seat, a seat full of owner occupiers, a seat full of middle class people. Well, Labour just bulldozed its way through the electoral geography uh, and really overrode the Conservatives who had looked very recently as if they could almost govern forever. 
It was a time when influential newspapers associated with the populist conservative right turned over, if not to the Labour Party, then to the cause of Tony Blair, who, as I say, had an appeal uh, far beyond that, which we can imagine today when he is a relatively unpopular figure in retirement, although his reputation with some voters, particularly Remain voters over the European Union, has recovered somewhat in recent years. It was a night of huge uh, shocks, like the toppling of uh, the cabinet minister, Michael Portillo, as we can see here, by the Labour candidate, Stephen, uh, Stephen Twigg, in Enfield Southgate, up there in North London. It was a night of huge celebration on the British left, liberal left, all the way to the, the, uh, the what you might call the far left, that the Conservatives were finally done with and gone after, remember, 18 years in power. Why did that happen? Well, you will have picked up the word sleaze in recent days in the news used by Labour. Well, one of the reasons they used that is that the idea of sleaze was very helpful to the Labour Party in the 1990s, as I saw as I took a, a quick grab, a quick trawl through the mass observation papers in this directive that mass observers were asked to complete in early 1997 through the year, late 1996. That what they noticed, the observers, was that the Conservative Party was caught in a, a series of scandals, series of financial scandals, series of sex scandals, a series of corruption scandals, which glued together, added up to a discourse of what Labour called sleaze. John Major, the Conservative Prime Minister of the time, had very unwisely talked about a quote unquote return to basics, a back to basics campaign, which he says had been wrongly taken to be a return to conservative moral standards that would have been talked about in the 1950s. And of course, opened the Conservatives to the opening up of their own private lives, which did not, shall we say, in, in some cases, bear the scrutiny of a very small C conservative uh, moral standing. And the Conservatives were partly crushed by the sense that they were uh, morally not fit for the job in all sorts of ways. But what I think I wanted to say today, I've spoken for five minutes in the, in the second half of what I'm going to say, is that Labour did not have its own way. And insofar as Labour did have things all of its own way, people were unsure about it. And also it happened for reasons that were nothing to do with the Labour Party and its modernising agenda. I should say that I'm writing a book about the Labour Party in office between 1997 and 2007. So I'm very interested in these papers. What did this mass observer say? Uh, I've never voted Tory and in my life yet, but John Major is not a bad lad, really. Far better than Tony Blair, who my husband calls the Joker uh, because of his resemblance to Jack Nicholson in the first Batman movie. Blair, of course, had this big grin, this big youthful appearance, this uh, very, he was called uh, Bambi by the Guardian, uh, the liberal left newspaper. And lots of voters, I think, were sceptical and they were worried about the fact that he seemed to sit in the centre of the political distribution and also that that might not be a sincere place where he sat. Right wing voters worried about the socialist red claw behind the Blairite appearance, behind the comforting Middle England tones of Tony Blair. But left wing Britons worried that Tony Blair would in some way betray or in some way go against their deepest held uh, views and feelings. A left-wing observer says here, I'm not sure of Tony Blair's intentions because I disapprove of his intention to abolish student grants, which would come with the introduction of student tuition fees after Labour took power, first to £1,000 a year and then up to £3,000 a year after two terms in office. There were also other themes, more prescient themes perhaps, for what was going to happen next in British politics in the era of populism, the era of the rise of the right and the time of Brexit. Because one of the reasons the Conservative Party's defeat was so shattering, especially in terms of seats, was actually the way in which the minor parties also ate into the Conservative vote. The Liberal Democrats, which I'll talk about in a minute, but also the referendum party, which was able to gain a small but significant share of the vote on the right with voters, as you can see here, perhaps who, in this case, admired the French National Front as the, the reassembly of the, the national patriotic right wing 
a movement that lots of voters look to and the relatively emollient, the relatively centrist figure of John Major could not give them. Another observer who looked to the referendum party of, of the entrepreneur and uh, Anglo-French businessman, uh, James Goldsmith here, who gained 3% of the vote. Partly as I think uh, none of the above party, partly I think as a protest vote, but also as a place where right-wing Britons could give their vote to, could register their discontent with the way Britain was going in all sorts of ways, social policy in terms of morality, in terms of uh, youthful people's uh, demeanour or behaviour. And we see this in UKIP and we see this in the Brexit party, parties that are going to have even bigger uh, tents and even bigger impacts than Goldsmith's referendum party. So what do I want to say to conclude about the mass observation papers and the 1997 general election? Well, what I want to say is that when we look back at 97, like all elections, it seems settled. It seems sure what's going to happen. But no electoral hegemony is clear, none is settled, and none is definitely going to happen. The Conservatives' large majority in 2019 was in doubt for a long time in that year. The hung parliament of 2017 was a shock. The Conservative majority of 2015 was a shock. And this election in 1997, like all elections, was much more complex than it looks. Partly because of tactical voting, which under first past the post, undermined Conservative majorities everywhere. There was a tacit behind the scenes deal between the Liberal Democrat leader, Paddy Ashdown, and Blair in order to attack where the Liberal Democrats were stronger or where Labour was stronger and to leave the other left leaning party to attack the Conservatives where they had the best chance of winning seats. And I think that where we dig under the surface, both anti-European right populist opinion was stronger than we think in 1997 and also that the qualitative confidence in Blair and New Labour was not so strong on both left and right as the numbers make it look. And that's important to conclude because the New Labour government of the time was going to be a very important government, perhaps in counterintuitive ways that we don't think about now or we don't imagine now. It was a government that was going to cut child poverty in half, partly through, for instance, uh, working families tax credits, so tax breaks for very low income working parents. It was a government that was going to, despite its reputation, raise taxes by quite a lot on the richest Britons and slash them and increase benefits quite a lot for the poorest Britons. And also it was a government that was going to build up a huge, you could even use the word tsunami of public spending on health and education. This is the annual percentage change of spending on the National Health Service, for instance, which for the first time got a concentrated and also elongated long term burst of spending under New Labour. So it's important to analyse this election, both because it was less sure than it looked at the time, full of all sorts of emotions and cares and worries and ideas, just like any election and uncertain in many ways under the bonnet or under the surface, but also because it ushered in a new period of increased social liberalism in the country and also increased state spending designed to equalise the country in poverty, if not in terms of equality of outcome. But with that, I'll leave it. And I think we've got time to generally discuss and take questions. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Glenn. Um, and indeed, thank you to all of our speakers today. I think everyone would agree that there's been some really fascinating topics and some great insights there. And I think a really good look at some of the material we have in the 1990s module of Mass Observation Project. Um, as I say, we do have some time for questions, so please do feel, feel free to submit those. Um, I'm just going to have a look through ones that have been submitted as we've been presenting. Um, quick one here, which I think for Jessica and Kirsty. Uh, will the recent data which covers the COVID-19 pandemic be made available? Yes, it is available um, now. You can um, either contact us to talk about how we can make it available to you or book in at the key to view the responses. Excellent, thank you. Um, there's one here which I think might be a, a rosy question. Um, you mentioned searching by individual data like age and location, um, but how did you implement this with the anonymity of the entries? Uh, 
Sorry, I think you muted there, Rosie. Yeah, I, I couldn't unmute myself there. Um, so as you all have seen from um, the of the snippets and quotes that um, some of the speakers shared, all of the observers uh, are, uh, are assigned a code and that code is assigned to each of the responses that are in the database. So they are completely, completely anonymous and any identifying information that may have slipped in you know, accidental slip of the pen, uh, including names and addresses and that sort of thing has all been all been anonymized. So any identifying data has been removed. Brilliant, thank you. Um, there's one which is sort of related to that. Uh, I don't know if it's again, it might be a Kirsty and Jessica question. Do participants sign release forms giving permission for use of their writings? Uh, yes, they do. They um, they sign a release form when they join the project, and we also continually remind them um, in the course of writing for mass observation that it, the material is being used and being looked at, um, just so they they don't think that we're a closed archive. That they understand that it's very much active today, and people are are coming all the time to see the responses. Great, I've got another uh, question for you guys as well. Um, when will the project open up again for new writing volunteers? Do you want to go, Kirsty? Or... <laughs> no, you can go for it, it's fine. Uh, OK, um, so we're thinking that we'll be able to open up the project again to new writers um, quite soon, actually, probably at the end of this month um, or perhaps early next month. Um, we all the time um, looking at how much space and capacity that we, we've got um, and that's something that we're going to look at quite soon and hopefully open up the project again to new writers. But as Kirsty said in our presentation, the 12th of May is next week and that there's um, anyone's welcome to do that. So please, um, uh, you know, now's a good time to think about uh, doing it and submit your diary next Wednesday to the archive. There actually is a question related to those 12th of May diaries, um, which asks, is that just UK based submissions? It is it is UK based because um, of the the work that the archive does is ma mainly based in the UK. But we did receive submissions last year from other countries, um, including America and Australia and Europe. So um, if anybody's living abroad, then we would we would equally accept it. But the focus is on the UK. However, we are um, in contact with other countries that participate in the 12th of May too, um, such as Sweden and Japan and China. So. Fantastic, lots of opportunities there. Um, just going through these questions, bear with me just a second. There's a question here, I'm not sure if this is talking specifically about uh, the Mass Observation 1990s module or Mass Observation in general, but it asks how many participants there are. I don't know, it's worth perhaps Rosie talking about Mass Observation at the 1990s module. To be honest, I think that um, Jessica and Kirsty could probably answer that better because all of the information that I have has come come from them. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, overall, um, ab over 5,000 people, pro probably more like 6,000 people have contributed in some form to mass observation. Um, and this is since 1981. Um, currently, I think we have around 700 people on our active writing panel, and I would say that probably 10 of those have been writing since 1981. Uh, um, so you'd be able to tr track their their writing um, over the 40 year period. Um, and there are so many of our writers who have been writing um, from the 90s and are still writing to this day. Fantastic, thank you. Um, there's a question here for Glenn, which I think you might have touched on in your presentation, but uh, the question asks, uh, what does Glenn think about Labour's electoral prospects at the current moment?
Mute me. Ah, oh, yes. Hi. I'm unmuted now. Uh, well, the, my answer is how long have you got? Um, well, I, I think that Labour's prospects are, as you can tell by reading in a newspaper, not the most fantastic. But but Labour Party has been written off three times before in the 1930s, in the late 1950s, when the great pamphlet Must Labour Lose was published. And then in the 1980s, when the SDP broke away. So nothing ever really changes. A left party in Britain under first past the post faces a massive challenge of winning both cities and towns, which are much more socially uh, uh, conservative and, and more perhaps more egalitarian in terms of spending. So Labour requires an amazing politician as a leader, which it had in its three winners, Attlee, Wilson and Blair. So it's a huge hurdle, but it's not an, an unsurmountable hurdle. If we're looking at the lessons of history, Labour takes quite a while to come back when it has been reduced to electoral rubble. Uh, in in uh, the 1950s, it was out for three terms, and in the 1980s, it was out for four terms. So it's now been out of power for what is it now? Um, 11 years. So probably um, my my perspective is things look uh, grey or vague, but they don't look hopeless. <laughs> Thanks, Glenn. A bit of a watch this space situation. I think so. Um, so I think that's all the questions we have at the moment. I'm just going to leave that open for sort of another 30 seconds or so, see if anyone else wants to pop any questions in there. I appreciate it takes a bit of time to, to type them out. Um, while we're just waiting, if you obviously want to find out more about Mass Observation Project, you can do that through our website, or you can contact your Adam Matthew representative. There's a bit more info on the screen there for you. So you can see our website there and our email address, which is info at amdigital.co.uk. Doesn't look like we've had any further questions. Of course, if you have any questions at a later date, please do like feel free to send us an email and we'll pass those along for you. Um, but I think perhaps with that, I will say thank you again. And I hope that we can welcome you to another Adam Matthew webinar in the future. And thank you again to all of our speakers um, and keep an eye out for the recording in your emails. Thank you, everyone. Bye.